Hi, you all, and a welcome uh, to this lecture by Professor Charles Matthews of the University of Virginia on Christian citizenship in the 21st century. The um, uh, couple of practical things as we get started. The um, first, let me ask everybody to turn off all your electronic devices. The um, stu for for some of the younger people in the room, they, they've never been informed that cell phones have off buttons, but they do. The um, if you feel around on there, you'll find it. The um, uh, uh, and the second thing is there's, a, there's a, some handouts going around. I don't think we have quite enough for everybody. So if uh, you, we could get one for every two people, there should be enough to, um, to, to go around. Yeah. I'm Ben Story, uh, the co-director of Furman's Tocqueville program, which is sponsoring today's lecture. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to say a little something about what the Tocqueville program is and um, what we do. So, the Tokpa program exists to encourage serious and open engagement with the moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. The Tokpa program includes a whole range of activities. We offer our signature course and lecture series, which this term is focused on Christianity and politics. We also sponsor a whole series of courses in the history of political thought. And we direct the Society of Tokpa Fellows which is a select group of students chosen by competitive application who dedicate a proportion of their coursework to the sustained study of the history of political thought. Finally, we work closely with the Political Thought Club, an independent student group that meets on Friday afternoons to read and talk about works in this tradition. That's a lively and fun group that's open to everyone. We meet on two thirties, uh, at 230s on Friday in the back of the political science department. We've just started a kind of philosophic reading of the book of Genesis. So if you'd like to join that group, now is a, um, now is a great time. The program is supported by a broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and generous individual donors, including Ginny and Sadie McNeil, Rabinell and Beth Curry, and the AWC Family Foundation. Our sponsors support the Tocqueville program in the belief that genuine liberal education encourages students to become more thoughtful citizens and more dignified human beings. And we're immensely grateful for their support. You can learn more about the Tokpo program's many activities and how to get involved with the things we do from the materials beautifully arranged on the table just outside the door. The, um, check us out. If you want a genuine liberal education while you're at Furman, we want you in our courses and other activities. Also, please stick around uh, after the lecture for reception. There is a sumptuous array of tasty snacks that will appear after the Q&A session when the magic wall here slides up. The um, hang around, uh, chat with us in our lecture. It's always fun. Um, OK, so as I mentioned a moment ago, our lecture series for the last, for this year and last year, the, um, has been organized around the theme of Christianity and politics. The relationship between Christianity and politics has been much in the news of late, between Supreme Court decisions such as Hobby Lobby and Obergefell, and demographic trends such as the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, a rapid increase, unprecedented in America, of Americans who identify with no denominational religious group, a trend particularly pronounced among the young. Many, many commentators believe the relationship between Christianity and politics stands at some kind of unprecedented pass in American history, which they regard, depending on their point of view, with either wild hope or apocalyptic despair. In truth, however, the deepest questions raised by events in the headlines predate our own moment by millennia. Christianity has existed in a tense, changing, sometimes fruitful, sometimes explosive relationship with the political communities that have been its earthly home for some 2,000 years. We thought we might contribute something to our present conversation about these issues on the Furman campus by exploring the enduring questions that define this relationship. Is Christianity a religion for slaves, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau argued? Or is the Christian distinction between the city of God and the earthly city the best defense there is for liberty, that is, the best defense there is against the totalizing tendency of all political orders, including our own. 
This is the fifth event in this two-year series. You can see videos of our previous lectures on the Tocqueville Program's website. And I particularly commend to you the fascinating conversation we hosted this fall between Professors Cornell West and Robbie George, two of the most renowned and influential public intellectuals in America on the left and the right, respectively. Later this year, we'll host two further lectures. Mark Lilla of Columbia University will speak on the return of political theology on March 30th. And Clifford Orwin of the University of Toronto will give our Walters lecture on April 13th, entitled Abraham's Confrontation with God, about that fascinating moment in the book of Genesis where, where Abraham has an argument with God and, and wins. The, um, we hope we, you will join us for, for all of these events. Now, to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Charles Matthews is the Carolyn M. Barber Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. He's the author of several books, including Evil and the Augustinian Tradition, and The Republic of Grace. From 2006 to 2010, he was editor of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, the flagship journal in the field of religious studies. And he was the inaugural director of the Virginia Center for the Study of Religion. He's been chair of the Committee on the Future of Christian Ethics for the Society of Christian Ethics. And he currently serves on the House, House of Bishops Theology Committee of the Episcopal Church. With his wife, Jennifer Geddes, he served a four-year term as co-principal one of, UV, of one of UVA's residential colleges, Brown College at Monroe Hill. Matthews spent much of his childhood in Saudi Arabia and was educated at Georgetown University and the University of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Charles Matthews for a lecture entitled Christian Citizenship in the 21st Century. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, an honor to be here, and uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me, because I have been reading about and thinking about Furman for a very long time. When I was uh, an undergraduate myself in, uh, uh, well, let's just say another millennium, uh, I was at, uh, I, I was thinking about what to write my undergraduate thesis on, and I came across uh, two books by a professor uh, who was at Furman, actually, Jim Edwards. And so I hope at one point to actually one day make his acquaintance. But uh, since then, I've taught a number of graduates of Furman in my own uh, program at the University of Virginia. And all I can say is that the students here have very large shoes to fill if you ever leave this institution and go to other institutions of higher education. We have large expectations for Furman graduates. Um, I will try to be as uh, droning on and boring as possible today as well, <laughs> thus hopefully giving the undergraduates the chance to argue for getting two or three CLPs instead of just one uh, for tonight's talk. Uh, for people who are not members of the Furman community, I, I, I tr trust me, that's a, that's a painful joke at somebody else's expense. <laughs> it's a great honor to be uh, in the Tocqueville Program's uh, series of public speakers, and I am extremely flattered to be here. I understand the program means to encourage serious and open engagement with moral questions at the heart of political life. What I want to talk about here is close to the heart of that description, I think, because I want to talk to you about the ethics and spirituality of Christian citizenship. Right now, of course, here in South Carolina, you are all too aware of politics. And I expect that that will last for a couple weeks anymore. But beyond the schizophrenia of political feast or political famine, there's a deeper level at which we are all responsible for being political actors these days. For those of us who are US citizens, this is perhaps an especially terrible and awesome responsibility. For the consequences of our decisions are far more geopolitically profound than, say, those of the citizens of Luxembourg. But pretty much everyone nowadays takes some shares of the responsibilities of self-government, at least in principle. And for those of you who don't take your share, I have bad news your share still gets counted against you in this world and possibly in the world to come. And that responsibility is increasingly of existential import. The French philosopher Michel Foucault once said, man was for millennia what Aristotle had said he was, a natural creature with a certain capacity for politics. But today, man is that creature whose politics puts his very nature into question. This is true ecologically and biotechnologically, as well as militarily, economically, socially, culturally, and politically. 
We live in a political world, as Bob Dylan once sang. And to imagine that you can avoid being political is itself a political choice and not one that I would recommend. The more you realize what this entails, the more terrifying it can become for you. Here I aim to articulate one way in which you can, as it were, confront that terror and work out your political lives in the appropriate dispositions of fear and trembling, to be sure, but also with faith, hope, and love. For Christians, the three core theological virtues. I want to articulate an Augustinian understanding of citizenship, one that can theologically inform your more historically parochial political understanding of citizenship and show you how to align your political engagement with your theological education and training. And yes, I said training. For almost the first thing that an Augustinian perspective will say to you is that we should understand God's gracious help as helping us to use our political lives here for the cultivation of those dispositions and features of character that make us fit to bear the weight of glory in the kingdom to come. Furthermore, this Augustinian vision of citizenship not only aims to use the common understandings of political practice to theologically fruitful ends, it also enacts a form of citizenship that is civically fruitful, particularly in these fearful times. Now, all this is very abstract. Let me try to put it another way, and especially for the students in the room. Early in the first volume of The Lord of the Rings, namely The Fellowship of the Ring, Gandalf explains to Frodo the history of Middle-earth as it has led to the moment of his explanation as they sit in Frodo's living room, in Bag End, in Hobbiton, before the fire with the one ring of power, the one ring to rule them all, there on the table between them. The whole history of Middle-earth has led to this quiet domestic conversation, and Frodo finally understands that his cannot be a normal, happy life. And then Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. I wish the ring had not come to me. To which Gandalf replies, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. God knows we teach you that you're special, all too much, perhaps. And certainly few of us need more urging to be narcissists. But I am afraid, for better or worse, that this is where we are today. Not just in the next couple weeks, but for the rest of your lives, you will, if God is merciful, be among the not too large proportion of people in the world whose luck as to be citizens of the US, whose education, and we hope, whose self-reflectiveness leads them to take a bit more responsibility for the fate of this nation and the world than many others can do or even could hope to do. The more you know about the choices that will be before you in coming decades, the more somber, the more terrified you may grow, and the more likely you will wish you had lived in quieter times. I certainly do. But Gandalf's reply is a reply to you as well. Here is where you are. What are you going to do now? And how are you going to do it? My talk today will be in two large parts, and it's in the outline you have before you. First, I want to say something about this conception of Christian citizenship, both in its theological and its civic forms. And then I want to discuss something of the particular challenges that political engagement particularly of a religious sort, not just Christian, but especially Christian perhaps, faces in our current and so far foreseeable future, at least in the United States. And then I'll conclude with one last, yet more sobering thought. Because, you know, Augustinians are supposed to be Debbie Downers. So that's what I'll, I'll try to be. My first sketch, my first task is to sketch uh, an Augustinian conception of how to be political. Now, I trust you've heard of Augustine, but let me just quickly refresh your memory. He's born in North Africa in 354. He dies in 430. In between, he had gone from being a promising child of a pagan father and Christian mother who became a very successful academic um, to a Christian initiate, to a Christian monk, a Christian priest, and then a bishop, and the greatest intellect the Western Latin-speaking churches had ever seen or would ever see, I think, and one of the greatest theologians that the Christian world has yet produced. He's well known for his treatises, like the Confessions and the City of God on the Trinity, but we hear his voice, I think, best in his letters, sermons, even his commentaries. I call my view Augustinian and not Augustine's, mostly because the context has changed, but I want to be faithful to what Augustine was trying to say, and so I will try to root it, somewhat at least, in his own direct thinking. Let me begin. 
The winter of 411-412 was a bleak time in the Roman Empire. On the last day of 406, the Rhine River had frozen over, and the German tribes, basically armies traveling with their families and cattle, who were huddled on the east bank, driven from their forests by the Huns pressing in from the steppes, had walked across the ice and into the empire. 200,000 people, we think, on that one night. Five years later, they were already savaging Gaul, and it was clear they would continue their depredations as they stormed across the provinces. 20 years later, in 430, Augustine would die in Hippo as that city was besieged by one of those tribes, the Vandals. But that was not, in fact, the worst thing. Another tribe, the Visigoths, had been wandering through the Balkans and Italy for almost 40 years, and in 410, they had had enough of thin Roman handouts, and they sacked the city of Rome itself. Now, as sacks go, it wasn't really that bad. You love to be able to say sentences like that. As sacks go. They were given free reign for the city, over the city for three days, and while there was murder, rape, and part of the populace was taken as slaves, the city itself was not destroyed. But it was the first time in almost a thousand years that a foreign army had drawn blood in the streets of Rome. It was no longer the empire's capital, but it was still the symbolic center of the empire itself, and every member of the emperor, empire was a citizen of the city of Rome. Right? The symbolic terror inflicted on every inhabitant of the Imperium Romanum was vast, for that Imperium was not simply a state among other states. The only other state nearby was Persia. The Imperium Romanum was civilization itself, beyond whose borders lay only anarchy. Rome had fallen and it had fallen to barbarians. Surely, this was the end of all things. In far off Palestine, St. Jerome's rather campy panic is exemplary of what a lot of people felt. For days and nights, I could think of nothing but the universal safety. When my friends were captured in Rome, I could only imagine myself a captive too. When the brightest light of the world was extinguished, when the very head of the Roman Empire was severed, the entire world perished in a single city. We have no comparison to what the shock of the fall of Rome meant for Roman citizens in this time. It was at this moment, in this mood of anxiety and gloom, sometime between September 411 and February 412, just over a year after the fall of Rome and still closer to when those in Africa had first heard the news, that Flavius Marcellinus, tribune and notary of the Western Emperor Honorius, stationed in North Africa, wrote to Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. Marcellinus had been sent to Africa basically to kind of oversee a series of church disputes by the emperor, and he and Augustine had become something of friends. Now he had questions not related to his official duties. He reported his difficulties in responding to some of the Roman refugees, devotees of the old gods, who angrily blamed the sack and all of Rome's ills on the Christians. Christ's teachings must be incompatible with the morals of citizenship, Marcellinus says, of those who care for public affairs. After all, Christ ta taught us, these people told Marcellinus, and he reports to Augustine, not to return evil for evil, to turn the other cheek, to give our cloak when one asks for a tunic, to go quite the distance with one who asks us. These commands are contrary to the morals of citizenship. It's wonderful to hear, 1,600 years later, the, the angry voice of old Roman nobles who have picked up the New Testament for the first time and realized, wait a minute, this is just nuts what this guy is teaching here. We can't run an empire like this. Politics, Marcellinus says, these people believe, requires violence and ruthless justice. Christianity preached selflessness and mercy. Truly, Christ's kingdom was not of this world. How, he asked Augustine, might one respond to this? Imagine getting this as an email. Augustine wrote back in a letter that we have. We have Marcellinus' letter as well. When these men read the divinely authorized command not to return evil for evil, they charge our faith with hostility to the commonwealth. But the crucial point to press in response to them, he said, is that a city is but a group of men united by a specific bond of peace, and that such a peace was secured best by those with the proper disposition. Right? Nonetheless, he acknowledged that much, much of the Christian morality was not immediately applicable to public affairs. But he understands that, in fact, in important ways, this disposition is at the core of it. And on the outline, this is the quote I'm going to read from Augustine's letter here. But for the cross of Christ, 
Where would the dreadful torrent of humanity's wickedness have carried us? Would anyone have escaped its waves? How deeply could we have been submerged? But the cross was established like a massive embankment of authority, high and strong. By grasping this solid support, we could steady ourselves and avoid being snatched away and engulfed by the immense whirlpool of persuasion, compulsion to evil that this world contains. It is in this cesspool of evil characters where the ancient ethos has been abandoned that the presence and assistance of heavenly authority is most needed. This exhorts us to voluntary poverty, restraint, benevolence, justice, and peace, and to true piety and to other splendid and powerful virtues. It doesn't do this only for the sake of living this life honorably or only to provide a peaceful community for the earthly city. It does so also to win everlasting glory, everlasting security for the heavenly and divine commonwealth of a people that will live forever. Faith, hope, and charity make us adopted citizens of this city so that as long as we are on our pilgrimage, if we are unable to reform them, we should tolerate those who want the commonwealth to remain with its vices unpunished. Ultimately then, Augustine argues that religious faith, Christian faith, does not disable civic virtue, but rather empowers it. Christians, in their engagement in public matters, have a properly religious as well as civic vocation. This passage expresses the vision of how morality can govern politics that Augustine exposited in his later, more considered, and galactically larger response to Marcellinus, the city of God. Augustine dedicated that vast treatise to Marcellinus, but really there was nothing in it that is not traceable to themes in these two paragraphs. At its best, the rest of my paper is but one more version of the same letter that Augustine wrote 1,600 years ago. 1,604 years ago now. On this picture, just to step back for this for a minute from Augustine, for overall picture of Augustine, Augustine's theology is centrally one of engagement. It understands God's purposes to be communion with creation, and hence the human's basic desire to be one of ever-deepening communion with God. This communion that is realized in this world, not through a sinful detachment from the world, but rather through a proper engagement with it. Indeed, the fundamental human fault is nothing other than just such an apocalyptic escapism, an impatient retreat into the self, the delusion that our inhabitation of the world is finally accidental to our essential nature. But God is not most fundamentally found by escaping the self, the world, or other people, but by engaging with them. And such engagement shapes us in ways good for our souls and the souls of our interlocutors. So Augustine's basic mode of engagement should be a practice of what we could call confessional openness to the world, to one another, and ultimately to God's continuing gift uh, to us of God's own being and our being in creation. It is our continued willingness to endure the new, to endure this time that God has given us, to endure life during the world, that gives us this practice its fundamental shape. To complement this larger theological vision, Augustinians want to suggest that the best, under, the best vocabulary to understand our engagement in public life, our engagement in politics, is organized not primarily around obedience to authorities, as has often been the case in Christian political thought, but rather around participation in self-governance. Such participation in public life offers a potentially rich and vigorous form of participation in God's order that we would be fools not to accept. After all, Christianity promises a polity. The trajectory of the scriptures is from garden to city, nomads and farmers to urbanites. A consummately political community is humanity's destiny. Augustine, after all, wrote the city of God, not the farm or the garden or the park of God. In heaven, we won't be camping. Christianity always embodies a pressure towards the, plur the plural, towards the public, towards openness, towards confessing what one believes, an evangelical movement into the world. And in this general vocation towards the true and ecstatic publicity of the kingdom of God can most definitely be manifest in Christian political action in two ways. First, in the theological understanding of this action, and then secondly also, in the etiquette of civic engagement. Let me say something first about this theological rationale. The theological rationale for this understands our engagement in political life simultaneously, um, purgatorially, and also um, sacramentally. 
In both ways, it is an ascetical engagement, an engagement that means to transform us through suffering, through our experience of the difficulty of this life, into new and better creatures. Augustine was, in all of his preaching and teaching, always at pains to impress on all Christians the importance of understanding the whole of their lives as being transformed by God's severe and generous mercy. And much like the Augustinian monk Martin Luther, a millennium later, he insisted not so much on the priesthood of all believers as much as um, the monkhood, the monasticism of all believers, the religious seriousness of the Christian life. In a sermon once, he said, Seculum autem hoc erimus est, which means the seculum, the world, the era of this world, that itself can be our hermitage, our desert. Right? The world can be our desert. In the same way that the desert was the desert for the monks, so the world can be the site where we encounter the temptations and the challenges of true Christian life. The ascesis of citizenship, then, can be understood as part of the ascesis of discipleship. And conversely, salvation consists not in some sort of redemptive escape from the world, but our proper reception of the world as the gift, the curious gift, of God's grace. Of course, politics as we have it here is not a natural fact about humans. It's a distinctively post-lapsarian one for Augustine. The world of politics is a fallen world maybe more obviously than some other worlds, although I've been in enough faculty meetings to know that it's not exclusive to political worlds. So there's a deep dialectical ambivalence about politics for Augustine. It is itself a consequence of the fall, and yet it can also be a means of our grace and redemption. It is purgatorial because an ascetics of public life built on the program of enduring uses involvement in public life to discipline one's positions, dispositions to create a pilgrimage, what Augustine calls a pilgrimage of our affections, our emotions, to see oneself as a voyager in the world. Pilgrimages are activities, but they are also ways of traveling and by traveling, encountering a suffering that transforms one. To be a pilgrim requires training, but this training is as much about creating appropriate longings as it is about creating appropriate um, capacities a longing, a cultivation for something that is not here. As Augustine says, the whole life of a good Christian is a holy longing, for we seek a goal unattainable in this world. And the more we accentuate our capacities to long for it in the right way, the closer we are to understanding how the false options that present themselves to us in this world are in fact just illusory. In this picture, politics is necessary but not sufficient but we must resist the inevitable trajectories of fallen political structures towards idolatrous self-aggrandizement. East of Eden, the realm of the political is not a direct reflection of the divine. It's only a sphere in which we participate in the divine obliquely. We properly, faithfully participate by resisting the closure of so much of what passes for politics. The inevitable gravitational tug of any political order towards claiming final sovereignty over every other possible form of human devotion, including especially the church, the neighbor, and the stranger. We must learn to live during the world, but not ultimately to expect to like it, if liking it means to find ourselves fully and completely at home here. But this restlessness is not in any way an anti-worldly escapism, which is a charge often leveled at Augustine. Instead, it endorses a deeper, more theologically charged worldliness, a version of the world, a vision of the world as sacramentally charged, rich with moments of revelation of God's presence, suffused with potential anticipations of the kingdom. If the purgatorial attitude helps us resist idolatry, here the sacramental moment reminds us to refuse despair. We must cultivate a sensibility that looks out just for such tantalizing moments of contact so that we must learn to seek God in all things, even, most daringly, in ourselves. As Augustine says in an Easter morning sermon one day to newly catechized, newly convert, newly baptized Christians, he says, you yourselves are the miracle of the body of Christ. You are the mystery that you say, I accept when you take the Eucharist. Both the purgatorial and the sacramental aspects of this theological rationale seek distinct theological goods. If the ever-present danger that the purgatorial attitude looks out for is idolatry, it, it accentuates the theological virtue of faith. 
the ever-present danger that the sacramental attitude defends against is despair, and it accentuates the theological virtue of hope. For hope is not always easy. This is especially so in the political realm. It's easy to imagine we will never be other than what we are, that we will always remain strangers, and that our relations with one another must ever be conducted on grounds of mutual suspicion and latent enmity, that nothing will ever change unless violence makes it change, which means nothing will be anything but violence. But the truth is, our world is riddled with miracles, even in the political realm. People come together to talk about changing the speed limit of a road or a school budget, and no one gets everything they want, but everyone feels that some justice was done. People who never met two months ago work very hard, day and night, for a presidential candidate they have both come to believe in and find themselves impressed at each other's devotion and goodwill, as well as the goodwill of the strangers whose doors they knock upon. They're like the eighth or ninth person to knock upon those doors, and the people still greet them at the door with the same kindness, hopefully. Even in things we might not immediately see as political, we can sometimes see a foretaste of the kingdom if we care to look for it. A busy bike messenger stops to help a stranger with directions. A cop stops a harried mother and instead of giving her a ticket, smiles and gives her just enough encouragement and retribution to get through the day. A white child takes a black man's hand who he does not know and in doing that reminds the man that the racism he sees and feels around him day after day is not in fact the natural fact about the world, but it must be kept in place by hard work. This sacramental attitude helps us see the glorious rightness of the right and the painful wrongness of the wrong, written into the fabric of the cosmos, only if we had eyes to see it. And you can see that in politics, maybe not as easily, but just as possibly as in any other aspect of human endeavor. Speaking ascetically then, Augustinians want to argue that Christians' public engagement during the world their citizenship in some earthly political community is not only valuable for how they do good to that community in ways that that community can already recognize, it's also helpful for shaping Christians themselves gratefully to receive and joyfully to communicate God's redemptive and consummative gift and thereby helps to fit Christians for citizenship in the heavenly kingdom to come in the Republic of Grace. This is a theology of citizenship, a, theology, a theological construal of the place of worldly political activity. Christians can understand this public engagement as a foretaste of the kingdom, but we are trained for that paradoxically in important ways, positively and negatively, by cultivating a deeper sense of longing for what the world itself cannot provide. But remember Augustine's letter to Marcellinus. Proper engagement in public life reflected through the discipline and vision of the theological virtues not only deepens its adherence, um, apprehension, and inhabitation of those virtues, it also contributes deeply to our pluralistic public life itself. Speaking civically then, Augustinian Christians will be citizens in a way recognizable and perhaps helpful, if at times annoying and discomforting to their fellow citizens who are not Christians, or at least not Christians of the right, cool Augustinian sort. Christian citizens should give appropriate attention to the civic and political order alongside appropriate resistance to the inevitable tendencies in this life towards political idolatry out of these virtues of faith, hope, and love. This theological citizenship does not fit smoothly into the well-traveled channels of public life. Each puts pressure, each of these virtues puts pressure in a different way on our ordinary understanding of politics and particularly on that understanding's temptations towards apocalyptic claims of completion, of full knowledge, firm control. I know what's going on. Through them, we come to see that our natural desire for community is unintelligible without understanding God's activity as integral to human community's constitution. And each virtue paradoxically demands more of our public life than that life wants to give, but expects less of it than that life claims to provide. One way to speak about this is to speak about the liturgy of citizenship. Citizenship is obviously liturgical in a civic sense because the Greek word liturgia, liturgy, simply means a work of the people, a baseball team, a chef and her or his sous chefs, a newscast report, this lecture. These are all liturgies. Right? These are all works of the people. They're collective institutional organizations. 
But citizenship can be a liturgy in another theologically more proper sense, an activity that the body of Christ undertakes in praise of God as creator, sustainer, and redeemer. To claim that civic life can be liturgical in this way is to suggest that civic life can be performed in a way that is continuous with, or perhaps related to, the liturgy of the blessed in heaven, that is, the Christian's eschatological destiny. How it is so um, is something that I want to explain now through three distinct kinds of common political practice in our world and how Christian Augustinians, or Augustinian Christians, can effectively work with those practices and yet also challenge them in interesting ways. First of all, let me say something very basic. There is no straightforward one-to-one -one relationship between Christianity and a particular policy agenda. There may well be non-negotiables for people, perhaps absolute opposition to legalized abortion, or the death penalty, or gambling, or what have you. But even those absolutes are typically contested by others of good faith, and anyway, they are always so couched in a larger social program that is filled with judgment calls that the whole network is inevitably contestable and modifiable. So there is no simple way in which the elucidation of any Augustinian vision of citizenship will immediately lead to a clear set of policies or a distinct political platform. Furthermore, we must humbly recognize the necessity of every actor's prudential political judgment. And because such judgment is invariably informed by the particular quirks and quiddities of our own personal perspectives, right, without collapsing into sheer preference, subjective preference, we can expect that the general dispositional program of an Augustinian citizenship will be manifest in our political actions, commitments, and judgments in quite diverse ways. In other words, in our world, there can be Augustinian Christian Democrats, and there can be Augustinian Christian Republicans, and there can be many other forms of Augustinian Christians. Okay? What will matter is not only what we do politically, though that will matter, but how we do it, and to what end, and oriented to what goods. Working these things out is always tentative, context-specific, and best undertaken in fear and trembling. As Lincoln said, it's always nice for someone to come to South Carolina and quote Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> as Lincoln said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Here I want to show how much an Augustinian vision of citizenship shares with these three distinct approaches to American politics today, and how it also challenges those attitudes to move in different ways than they usually do. Now, in talking about these three, I am not talking about particular partisan alignments. I am talking about three ways of understanding what politics is in our country today, which are broadly taken up in different ways by the two parties and by other people as well. But you'll find, as I, as I hope, uh, these categories actually are visible in members of both political parties or people who are committed to both political parties in the left and the right in our, in our world today. The first movement is what I want to call, what is generally called, civic republicanism. And this is not the GOP. This is, in fact, the form of classical civic republicanism. Civic republicans emphasize the power and value of, of participation and engagement in political life, both for itself and its effects on moral character. For civic republicans, politics is a necessary part of the life of liberty and virtue. So you can see the roots of this in someone like Aristotle and Cicero, someone like Machiavelli, arguably someone like Rousseau, even a figure like Hannah Arendt in, our, in the 20th century uh, was similar to this. Now an Augustinian perspective will share a lot with a civic republican perspective. They agree that a society's civic health and its moral health are deeply related. And in this way, an Augustinian theology of citizenship borrows a great deal from the moral and political psychology of civic republicans. But these civic republicans also have dangers that Augustinians will wish to avoid. They sometimes say things like, one ought to love one's city more than one's own soul, which Augustinians will see as akin to a dangerous totalitarianism. And a very well-known republican thinker, someone like Rousseau, has worried about whether Christians can be properly attached to their polities. This is the worry about the religion of slaves. It's fantastic. And it's in the, uh, it's the, the end of the social contract, or is it the discourses? Yeah, the social contract where he says he's, read, he's written this wonderful book about the politics and the ideal political world. And then at the end, 
he does this completely strange thing and he says, of course, all this means is that Christians should never be part of politics because they're just deeply problematic people. Right? <laughs> Christian publishes, and, and Rousseau publishes this to a Christian Europe. Right? He was always, a, he was the original troll, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> So Christians will need to be wary of some dimensions of the civic republican energy. And most deeply, Augustinians' visions of the, oh, sorry, Republicans' visions of the, pub, civic republicans' vision of the public sphere and the life of politics as the central place where the human good gets secured will strike Augustinian Christians as insufficiently theologically ventilated. Politics, as we have it, is an imperfect and fallen realm. Augustinians want to remind the Republicans. And the human good always seeks more than it is able to require here. So Christians should understand against the Republicans, that civic Republicans, that political life is in two senses endless. First of all, it has no goal, no final end where it can be stopped. Tactical aims it has, out the wazoo. But none of these, nor some combination of them, nor the ideal image of the ideal community lying perhaps behind them, can be allowed to gain a total or theological sovereignty over citizens' imaginations. Politics is necessarily penultimate and provisional. Christians engage in politics because they cannot do otherwise, and they understand themselves to be doing non-messianic work in doing it. But second, political life is endless in that it should seek no closure or stasis in terms of things that are inappropriately politically assessed. The goal is to keep things unsettled, so politics is supposed to be exhausting. It is supposed to be able to rove over your whole life. It is supposed to be a pilgrimage, not a homestead. No realm of human life can be immune from becoming a topic of political debate, and there will be no end to politics in time. As Reinhold Niebuhr, who has a reasonable claim for being called an Augustinian Christian citizen, once put it, the New Testament does not envisage a simple triumph of good and over evil in history. It sees human history as involved in contradictions, uh, in the contradictions of sin to the end. The second general approach is a broadly classically liberal one, which emphasizes the importance of private property as a bulwark against an overly interventionist state. You can see that the ordinary uses of these terms today and their uh, classical uses are in some ways exactly opposite. But I want to stick with these classical uses. I think they actually help us in a certain way. Here we should recognize this liberalism's value, Augustinian Christians insist, as a provisional and in some ways tragic account of politics, while still noting the ultimate inadequacy and the poverty of the language that liberalism appeals to in this way. The respect liberalism gives to individuals is most often in understood, formulated in terms of individual privacy and their ultimate and inviolable separateness from one another. As pragmatic aim, this definitely has its benefits. But for Augustine, of course, privacy always has theologically problematic undertones. The cognate for privacy in Latin is privatio, privation. Either Satan or Adam and Eve were the first private people. None of these are good people to be named, right? Privacy, deprivation, and impoverishment were always related for Augustine. Human sin is privation in a way that not merely is etymologically related to the word, it's solitude, isolation, what the Augustine scholar Robert Marcus calls man's liability to close in on himself. At bottom, sin is a retreat into privacy. Conversely, redemption is in a way publicity, presence to others and most fundamentally, a presence to God, a turning back to God, to the neighbor, and creation. And yet, respecting privacy on the pragmatic level is a thoroughly, acceptably Augustinian thing to do. Augustine, after all, did write the Confessions, the first great autobiography telling the story of the unknowable individual soul in some way. Of course, he did try to tell that story, right? So you can see the tension that's available for Augustine in thinking about this language of interiority and privacy. After all, Augustine's analysis of sin made him deeply suspicious of claims for human authority, the kinds of claims that anti-liberals typically use to try to override privacy. He typically hedged his theoretical arguments for authority with an insistence on the importance of a scrupulous and meticulously self-critical attitude 
on the part of the authority itself. And his own behavior as an authority was often self-subverting and self-critical in ways that made his own contemporaries, his fellow bishops, nervous and his theological descendants un-Augustinian precisely to the degree that they forgot his example and relaxed into claiming an untroubled magisterial authority. Despite all the rumors of authoritarianism, tyrants will find little succor in his thought about what it means to be somebody's boss. His insistence on the need for explicit authorities is really an appeal to humility on our part when faced with authorities of the past, not an arrogation of power and pride into the office of bishop. Differences in rank and function among humans shrink to insignificance when compared with the common task set before us, the task of coming to praise God and with our common condition of being sinners. In his own day and in ours, Augustine's account is remarkable for how it places all human majesty under the judgment of a transcendent lordship that is always escaping perfect representation by whatever authorities claim to offer it. Furthermore, Augustinians can honor liberalism's other profound apprehension. For alongside its salutary recognition of the protective nature of privacy in politics, the pragmatic value of this, it also recognizes the dignity of the individual. Classical liberalism recognizes the dignity of the individual in a way that speaks of a different and deeper apprehension. The apprehension that humans long to be seen, to be recognized, to be respected and loved by their fellows as having value. Augustinians see the roots of liberalism to lie in this way in a recognition of the individual to be in some fundamental way um, admittedly left alone in this messy world that we live in, but they also see the recognition to lie in a previous and more profound recognition of the value of the individual and the absolute good of each person's individual uncoerced communion with others as at the core of their flourishing. And we can still experience vestiges of this communion today, and in doing so, accentuate for liberals, our liberal colleagues, our liberal neighbors who are not Augustinian Christians, we can make them remember something of the positive value that they once were driven to affirm. One excruciating and maddening fact about public life that we've all encountered probably in the last 24 hours if we thought about politics at all, is the fact that um, conversation with others um, reveals to us that others are often tantalizingly rational. That is, they seem amenable to reasoned conversation and dialogue. It looks like we're actually making sense of what we're arguing to them, but effectively they never come around to our point of view. Right? We've all had this experience. The tantalizingly rational, I'm talking to you, I'm using verbs and nouns and we're using grammar, you're hearing me, and yet all of my words don't seem to make any effect on you. right? So clearly, you must be some sort of demonic robot if you're not just like me. Right? In other words, these conversations can simultaneously accentuate for us the proximity of our minds to each other and also the way that we are apart. In many ways, classical liberalism has nothing to say about these situations beyond told you so. But Augustinian political love offers another way of thinking about this. Perhaps, in fact, in these moments, we see the tantalizing possibility that we are both fragmentedly reaching towards some common good. Even our disagreements may themselves be a possible sign of hope if we continue to find them as disagreements we care about. For those of you who are not in marriages yet, one of the most comforting things about a marriage um, that a, a, a couple's counselor or a, a priest will tell you is that um, the danger of a marriage is not in the arguments. Um, it's entirely when those arguments stop. In other words, having fights is part of what a marriage is about because you're negotiating two very richly interesting and very interesting, trust me, very interesting uh, distinct people. Um, it's when the two people give up fighting that you actually have a problem, right? So as long as we continue to be so deeply annoyed at our politi political interoculars that we keep trying to argue with them, we cannot yet give up hope. Augustinians will agree with liberals that now we see others as in a glass and darkly. But they go beyond them in affirming that one day we shall see them face to face. And even now the promise of that deeper communion can from time to time pop up as a real fact in public life. And it's not something to be run away from. The third common political movement increasingly popular on college campuses today is what I will call broadly cosmopolitanism. 
Cosmopolitanism expresses the absolute good of universalism, but it also expresses a righteous impatience with the kinds of limits and boundaries and local attachments and parochial affiliations to tribe or creed or community or country that so often annoy the universalist. Once again, there is something deeply right and deeply theologically appropriate about this universalist drive. After all, the parable, the, the absolute demand for universal concern, as captured in the parable of the Good Samaritan, has served to mobilize Christian regard for people far away since the story was first written down. And the story of the expanding circle of moral concern that these Christian narratives have from time to time fueled for the world, right, to deal with the slave trade. Right now it's dealing with, in our country, a lot of issues around sex trafficking. Um, these facts cannot be denied. The peril, though, of this is that there is often a longing attached to this universalist drive to refuse the realities of worldly existence, namely locality and particularity. I do have special attachments, after all. And not everybody is at all times my neighbor. In fact, the original word for neighbor, which has a very rich and theological sense for us now, just means the person nearby, right? In ancient Greek and also in, in, in Konya Greek and also in, in Latin. In Latin, you'll see it sometimes on walls in, in Europe and stuff. It's proxime, the proximate person, right? That's part of why um, people were puzzled about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is, my, who is the person who's near me? Well, how can I know? You know? And that's why Jesus' answer was basically, look around. <laughs> right? There is a latent hostility to particularity in this universalist account sometimes. Something of a resentment about this world's inequalities and lumpinesses. Augustinians can infirm the impatient drive to universalism, but they also insist that you have to start at home with those with whom you already have a history, those nearby you. Right? College students are among the most idealistic in the world, and they are always coming up with very interesting schemes to get um, you know, new wells dug in parts of the world that need fresh water and things like that, and that's all very important. But they'll often, often not pay attention to the fact of the surrounding communities where they live at least for four years, and not really pay attention to the needs that are more proximate to them. Right? That's the sort of thing that an Augustinian citizenship will remind you of. You should not just be concerned with the person on the other side of the world if that concern eclipses for you the possibility of ignoring the neighbor who's at your door. Nonetheless, the core motive of inclusion at the heart of this cosmopolitanism is a powerful one and wholly consonant with the Christian message. Such radical inclusiveness has the advantage of suggesting more distance between a person's position or station and their proper significance than almost any other language. In recognizing the other as a genuine living other, by seeing the other as a neighbor, we seek truly to see them. To see the neighbor is to see them as infinitely valuable. In Augustinian terms, as C.S. Lewis once said, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. This recognition of the awesome value of the individual human being is at the basis of the ethical language of dignity. And to learn to speak that language well is a task that if the, if the cosmopolitan wants to try to take it on, Augustinian Christian citizens ought very definitely to try to encourage them to do. It's not an easy task. Indeed, it's not the task of everyday social life. In fact, that life may seem to run better if we actually evade that task. After all, the masks we place upon each other, one after the other, first stranger, then neighbor, then friend, child, or parent, or lover, colleague, enemy, or ally, these are all often strategies of helping us negotiate the world in proximity to one another without ever asking, who are you? So much of our knowledge of one another is in this way little more than an ensemble of techniques for avoiding facing each other. And this is one reason why social life can be strangely dissatisfying even as it grows more efficient. And the dissatisfaction consists fundamentally in this, our tacit recognition that we actually want to see one another, not just work around each other. Or better, that each of us is worth seeing in ourselves for who we truly are. For Christians, this has an evangelical power as well. Our solicitousness for our neighbor does not end itself in their bare there 
To see the neighbor is to see a mystery that transcends itself and iconically refers to the larger reality of God beyond it. The dignity of the neighbor is the glow of a divine purpose, imminent within her or him, yet also not exhausted by her, her, by her or his imminent immediate presence. To see the neighbor is to love the neighbor, and to love the neighbor is to be awed by and drawn to the other whose love for the neighbor anchors our own, namely God. Right? God loves each of us and knows us by name. In light of this, we seek the neighbor out as co-participants in our common task of adoring God. And so, once again, for this kind of Augustinian Christian citizenship, politics leads ineluctably to theology. Now, all this is very theological and abstract, and it can only become material in a kind of particular moment, in a particular historical context. And today's context is an interesting one to think about. I want to end by kind of sketching a few things about this context. And so this is the 21st century context in the hour. First, I want to say something about the current moment in world history, and then something about three distinct characteristics of our common American life. Lots of people complain that we are in an unprecedented situation with the collapse of an overall moral framework that determined the shape of common life. There are some people today, Christian and non-Christian alike, who will tell you that our world is going to hell in a handbasket. They'll tell you that families are under assault, education is dead, politics is dying, everything is controlled by the courts and a bureaucratic rationality and liberal elites and banks and corporations. They think we inhabit an essentially pagan environment. They think we face a moral apocalypse or at least a moral dark ages. I would urge you to take them seriously, but not literally. For such a simplistic vision obscures some important complexities to our situation. It's not entirely wrong but it's in some ways more complicated, which makes it in some ways more, even worse than that. Speaking as Christians, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. I agree that in important ways, we are at the end of Christendom, but the end of Christendom has two meanings. On one level, Christendom is over. If we understand Christendom to designate an effort to shape and sustain civilization on explicitly Christian terms, polities, throughout the world have largely left that ambition behind. Our world is too religiously pluralistic and many are not identifiably religious at all. And the status of religious beliefs, their, relig their legitimacy in public, and the sincerity with which we try to organize our lives through them are far more fragile and recognizably contingent than they have ever been before. Now I am one of those people who doubt that we have seen any kind of irreversible secularization in our world. Trained eyes, our condition is one of increasing pluralism, not evacuation of religion. But if there is any truth to secularization, it lies in the collapse of this ambition towards building an ever more mono-religious society. But there's another sense in which we live at the end of Christendom. If in one way Christendom is over, in another way we have reached its end because Christendom has been, in interesting ways, accomplished. Don't look now. But we are living in an age of remarkable moral revolutions and movements, which, while they are by, all me by no means all directly inspired and guided by the tenets of Christianity, still all emerge out of profound motivating energies of Christian provenance. Right? Historical study after historical study shows us that NGOs, the United Nations, the idea of human rights, the idea of the Western individual, all spring from profound moral commitments rooted in Christian moral movements. And if the work of philosophical thinkers like Charles Taylor um, and Didier Fasson, another guy who says this too, is correct, and I think it is, we live in an age of an astounding moral revolution. And these moral revolutions are, to use social scientific jargon, path dependent upon their Christian background. Even the self-proclaimed secularists that Christians will interact with are deeply moralized and the content and forms of their moralization are decisively determined by the larger heritage of Christianity. In fact, even secularization itself depends on a certain heritage from Christianity. Not only are so many of our so-called secular practices, categories, and judgments, in fact, little more than Christian practices, categories, and judgments, with the Christian language removed, but the deep Christian structure behind them is retained. And this is especially ironic. Even the categories which we use with all our earnestness to describe our world as secular, categories that we hope truthfully describe the changing realities of our world and are not biased towards one religion or one philosophical position or whatever, 
These categories themselves emerge out of the religious tradition whose decline they are meant to chart. The very word secularism is itself, in its origins, a theological word. I already said this in Augustine's sermon, seculum, hoc, uh, seculum autem hoc eremus est. The seculum itself is a category which is irredeemably stained and marked and shaped by a Christian provenance. That is to say, the very tools we try to use to make the point that we are no longer in a Christian environment are themselves irremediably and inexpungibly marked by their own Christian provenance. And this is our general condition. It may be lamented if you like, it may be uh, claimed if you wish, but it cannot be escaped. I don't say this out of any kind of smug Christian triumphalism. I'm not saying that there cannot be a Jewish secularism or a Muslim one or any other kind. I'm merely saying that ours is not one of those. If you don't think this society is decisively marked by Christianity, talk to Jewish people about what they traditionally do on Christmas Day. Or talk to a Muslim friend about what it's like to practice the month of Ramadan here rather than a majority Muslim country. In a way, we ourselves are, in front of, in front of me and myself, the victory of Christendom whether you are Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or nothing at all. In so very many ways, we live in a world that is deeply Christian in shape and detail. And the greatest explorers of this truth have themselves been both Christian and non-Christian. Thinkers like Friedrich Nietzsche and Max Weber on the non-Christian side, a Christian thinker like Soren Kierkegaard. They, full, they knew full well the power of received categories to continue to shape the way the present imagines the options for thought and action in life. And their questions should be ours. What does it mean not to be a Christian, per se, but to act in public as one in a context which is at once structurally hospitable to Christianity, though perhaps culturally suspicious of Christian public action? And what's more, Christians acting in America will also have to learn to act in light of several other cultural changes buffeting American culture. And so I want to turn to them next, quickly, before I end. I want to name them very simply by these three, these three dates, 9-11, 1989, and 1968. The first thing about 9-11, let me go back before 9-11. In the post-war period and in the Cold War, America had the convenient fact of having as its enemy a group of states which were not simply connected ideologically by communism, but also connected ideologically by a systematic atheism. In other words, we never just opposed the communists. We opposed the godless communists. This was helpful. The godlessness of this enemy lured Americans to affirm themselves as godly, more godly, in fact, than their public culture than they ever had been before. Right? This is the period where we add, we, we add in God we trust to the currency. We add under God to the, uh, the pledge. After 9-11, however, well, after actually the fall of the Soviet Union, the central imagined enemy is no longer godless. And after 9-11, the enemy becomes all too godly. Thus, for the first time since H.L. Mencken in the 1920s, we have seen in the last decade the rise of free thinkers and atheists, like the new atheists, right? These are popular figures now. I'm not saying they're central or primary or anything, but it's a fascinating fact that once we remove this kind of godless enemy and we replace it with a godly enemy, suddenly, um, you know, interesting atheists come back into business. And they're like, we, we were telling you guys this all along. We were, unfortunately, we're tagged with the commies, but now they're gone, so we're back. Um, and that's really interesting, right? Godliness and Americanness have loosened their association. And American public life is more ambivalent about religious actors now than it has been for a long time. And this is the context in which new religious interventions must operate. And it's going to create fresh and complicated pressures for anyone who wants to speak religiously. The second thing, the collapse of communism after 1989, very quickly here, it is another moment where not so much um, the change in the religious culture, but the change in the moral culture. Since 1989, there's been very little resistance to the idea that an ever unfettered um, economic culture is the best thing around. The, just consider the voluble discussions in the American political context of papal encyclicals about bioethical matters and the near complete silence about similar encyclicals written by the same popes about economic justice and consumerism. The collapse of any broad-based socialist counter-imagination to the triumphant economic liberalism, uh, neoliberalism regnant today, 
even after the most dramatic financial crisis since 1929 and the most devastating economic depression since the 1930s, is not simply a matter of a regrettable narrowing of a, the range of our economic ideologies. It also means that politically and morally, we hardly know how to articulate the breadth and depth of our problems in anything like their actual profundity. The only things we have going for us right now, it seems, are on the, um, in the political realm, right, this kind of crazy campaign by Bernie Sanders, and in the religious realm, Pope Francis' fiat, right? His, his tiny little car he drove around in Washington. And then finally, and I think most interestingly and complicatedly in this context, 1968 represents for me the intense ideological backlash since the 1960s against the energies of liberal Christianity a backlash led in large part by conservative Christianity, and the intramural squabble, which has led to the increasing delegitimation of Christian action on both sides in the eyes of the public. Right. Robert Putnam and David Campbell's book, American Grace, makes very clear the tremendous antipathy with which Americans younger than 45 currently view uh, institutional Christianity and especially conservative Christianity. The political defeats the religious right has suffered in the past 15 years now look to be coupled with demographic defeats as well. As a majority of younger Americans identify conservative Christianity with homophobia and racism, um, which is astonishing given a number of things we know about conservative Christians and their charitable giving and things like that. Right? But effectively, um, a political edge of the larger conservative Christian community has caused the perception of conservative Christianity to be damaged. This doesn't mean that liberal Christianity won, by the way. Um, the American historian David Hollinger says that liberal Christianity's meteoric trajectory across the 20th century spent itself in inaugurating the social and cultural movements that got out of control in the 1960s. The gains in justice uh, that, the, that these movements created for liberal Christians cost the churches a great deal of their soul. Today, he argues, in terms of members and moral energy, the liberal churches which served as carriers of these moral movements in the 20th century are husks of their former selves. While since the 1960s, the energies of moral reform that they, they inaugurated have become untethered from the churches and diffused into new institutional infrastructures of functionally secular, non-governmental organizations. This story is the story of the mutual defeat of liberal and conservative Christianity since the 1960s. And it raises two questions for Christians interested in public life. On the one hand, there's the lively pluralistic culture of moral reform into which churches and Christian citizens must now operate. If the churches wish to revitalize this part of their mission, if Christian citizens want to act, they must operate in a new institutional and moral environment where they must articulate their distinct message amidst the flurry of rival moral voices, some sympathetic, some hostile, but all competing in the same space for public attention. On the other hand, Christians still have not figured out how to hold on to their particular theological vocation within a fraught public context. While the past century saw the churches live into their vocation of social concern on the left and the right, they may have harmed their more fundamental vocation of training their members to become fit for the weight of glory that is our eschatological destiny as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. My proposed Augustinian Christian pedagogy of political discipleship is meant to help remind us of this more fundamental task and realign the political engagement with the theological. And with that, I want to end. But what, you may ask, ever happened to Augustine's provocative correspondent, Flavius Marcellinus? Well, he died, <laughs> as will we all but his end was more significant than we sometimes give it credit for being. His end was dishonored and tragic. Two years after his correspondence with Augustine, in the midst of an attempted abortive coup in the Western Empire, he was accused falsely of plotting against the emperor he had served, and despite Augustine's desperate attempts to stop it, he and his brother Apringius were executed in public by a fearful, anxious, paranoid government through decapitation by the sword on 13 September 413. This is especially important because Augustine at this point had already released the first three books of the City of God. And of course, in the preface to the first book, Augustine dedicated the book to Marcellinus. But he never changed the dedication. There was never any thought, it seems, 
that in fact the book should not be dedicated to this good man. It's worth noting that he never revoked the dedication. Indeed, I suspect Augustine liked the thought that the book was dedicated to him. It means that the first and perhaps best reader of Augustine's vision of political duty stands as a tragic warning of what may await any who wish to follow him. And so perhaps we who come after him as readers of that text and as thinkers in an Augustinian vein can learn several things from his correspondence with Augustine and the book that that correspondence provoked, though all or almost all that he knew of the world has passed into ruin, rubble, and dust. If you do learn something, spare a thought for Marcellinus, who, though no doubt a sinner, fulfilled his duties to his several cities, his several republics, and paid the price that must be paid in one form or another for so doing. If we do that, both he and Augustine might well have said, to God alone be the glory. Thank you very much. Question about the um, the acetal, acetical quality, of, right, aesthetical yeah, yeah. quality of politics. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of evidence that Christian theology was strictly pacifist before Augustine, and so I was wondering if it's possible that in his effort to justify Christian citizenship, he, after the sack of Rome, if he had to compromise his theology, and if it's possible that rather than shaping Christians, politics will shape Christianity. Absolutely. I mean, that's always and everywhere and in all cases a possibility. And I would say almost certainly a reality that, in fact, that communication goes both ways. Uh, Christianity gets infected in certain ways. And Augustine tried as much as he could to protect that from happening to his thought, and he tried as often as he could to warn people not to trust him. There's a wonderful sermon where he says, um, look, I am not the scriptures, and I get more angry at that guy who believes what I say just because I say it than the guy who um, thinks I'm wrong even though I'm right, right? Which is an interesting uh, ego trip for Augustine there. But it's, uh, so I do think that he's very worried about that. I would say that I don't think that, um, I, d I don't think that the Christian churches were pacifists before Augustine, although I know that there's a powerful uh, narrative out there that says that Christianity loses its moral and spiritual integrity after Constantine becomes a Christian. Um, I'm pretty sure Christianity lost its moral and spiritual integrity uh, the first or maybe the second time Peter denied Jesus. Um, so I, I set the decline earlier um, than, than that. Some secular thinkers and some secularists do have a great deal of hostility towards Christianity. It's not the case that all of them do. Um, it depends very much on the people you're talking about and who you're working with. Um, people who work in um, international human rights, international non-governmental organizations and things like that often have come to realize that um, apart, from, <laughs> apart from major um, corporations, um, the most resourceful and innovative people will be religious missionaries or religious uh, relief workers who can get to places before almost anybody else. One of my friends was, um, did a dissertation on uh, human and, uh, humanitarian movements, and he said that the, um, when the, uh, was it, I think the French army moved into Rwanda after the massacre, they actually found two groups ahead of them. Some were members of Coca-Cola, and then others were part of World Vision. Um, and, we're, and, and that's an interesting fact, right, that these are two very powerful international governmental things, and they, they work for very different ends, um, but they're both able to do this. And so in that, in different regions, people are very um, okay about it. I think there's a larger 
uh, a hangover often by people who have uh, felt, uh, not to be psychological about this, but uh, that uh, the dominant Christian imagination has at times um, suppressed or retarded certain other um, voices or particular uh, points of view that they feel like were more important out there. Um, and I think that's a possibility as well. Um, so I think there is some definite hostility there uh, and suspicion on some parts. Um, my, my sense, though, is that most of the time the right response to that is kind of befuddlement and you get everybody else on your side. Yes, sir. Uh, recently, a uh, presidential candidate made this comment that religion is appropriate in the kitchen and in the pews, but beyond that, it's in inappropriate. What, what is that message trying to tell us? Oh, I think that's a, I, I don't know who said that. It's interesting. I, I think that's a statement that um, effectively is uh, one that I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy. It's an argument that religion is an appropriate thing in our private life and can maybe, in a, in a mute way, mobilize us to public action. It can give us the motivation for public action, but we ought not to talk about what motivates us to public action. Um, this was a powerful view um, that was very forcefully and persuasively put forward maybe in the 1970s especially by a political philosopher named John Rawls. Uh, he later changed his view when it was pointed out to him that very important parts of American public life like, for example, Lincoln's second inaugural and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, both would have been ruled out of court as appropriate political interventions by his own speech code. Um, and so he decided to change his view that way. And I think that's a reasonable thing. I think it's more honest civically if we actually talk to each other about what actually drives us. Now, to do that without coming across as my way or the highway, that might be tricky, but once we've gotten past that first absolute bar, then we're talking about techniques and what are the best strategies and how to do that in an honest way. Um, and at that point, we're having a good conversation, or a real one, anyway. Whether it's good or not, it <laughs> could be painful. Yeah. I have one more question, and sure. I'm going to take the privilege of asking it. Uh, you do this wonderful thing of describing how sensitive an Augustinian perspective is to the tremendous moral ambiguities in the world. So we can see the good and the ill in cosmopolitanism, we can see the good and the ill in mm -hmm. classical liberalism, we can see the good and the ill in civic republicanism. And that's like, that's, that's totally true to like my own experience of trying to understand the world. Sure. But I, I don't know how to square it with Christian demands for, you know, Heroic moral dedication. Mm -hmm. That's, I, that's, yes, I think that's the question. Um, let me see if I can formulate the question um, and see if I'm being fair to you, because I think it, I, I can even make it worse for me. Um, haven't I made Augustine um, make everything ambig ambiguous and ambivalent in a certain way so that there's no clear right and wrong? And isn't it the case that, in fact, for a uh, uh, religious vision of any sort, let alone Christianity, um, that's going to do damage to our motivations in some ways and, and our actual uh, belief structure because there are ultimate rights and wrongs? Is that fair? Yeah. Well, I hope I haven't. Um, I hope what I'm trying to say is that in the attempt to inhabit in all honesty and with humility, um, the situation of a very complicated world, you will find that the challenges that are presented to you and the opportunities for heroic struggle may not be um, always in the matter of very dramatic things. They may actually be very microscopic. Heroism can be manifest, it seems to me, in shutting up and letting someone else explain to you why they think you're so deeply wrong. Um, and, that, and that heroism can be as real as another kind of heroism. Uh, that would be much more dramatic, the, the heroism of martyr. Um, I would say 
uh, that if we reach the point where there need to be martyrs in the streets, where there need to be real heroes, um, in some ways, we've already lost. Um, I mean, we may reach that point in different places. Um, we may reach the place where the guy stands in front of the, cha the tank outside of Tiananmen Square. Um, but uh, much of the time, your moral duty is to try in much more small le ways to try to um, uh, let, n not yourself be a hero, but let, uh, let the grace that is surrounding you be manifest to you, and then maybe through you as well, um, by patience and forbearance um, and fortitude. It can, be, it can require all the courage in the world to just listen to um, a friend or a student, um, let alone your boss, tell you why you're wrong um, and for you to realize they're right. Um, that's, what I would, that's what I would say there. So there is, there, is, there is opportunity for drama, but don't underplay the opportunity for local, small, microscopic moments of heroism as in some ways more demanding. Yeah. Let's, uh, remember, there's a reception right over there. You can eat and drink stuff. The, um, and uh, let's uh, thank Charles Matthews. And <laughs>